I want to reflect tonight on uh, prayer. It's a key feature of our lives as believers in Christ, and yet we often find it a very difficult uh, exercise, and we're often embarrassed by our own failures uh, in that area. Uh, John Knox said that whenever there is faith, there is prayer, and where there's no prayer, there is no faith. It's that important. It is the breath of our whole spiritual lives. And I want to focus, uh, first of all, on the words of Paul in Philippians chapter 4, and uh, the words uh, particularly uh, from verse 4 uh, into uh, verse 5. Philippians 4, and uh, from uh, uh, verse uh, 5, uh, well, verse 4 downwards. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your, re- re- your uh, uh, reason be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, uh, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known uh, to God. In this passage, uh, Paul is... Uh, describing prayer for us and making plain what he thinks it actually means uh, for us as believers. We are tempted often to be anxious about uh, so much in our own lives and also in the church's life as well and we uh, spend uh, so much energy in anxiety and worry. And Paul is saying, but instead of that he said, uh, let's uh, turn to God and ask him to help us cope with this particular situation. And I want to focus here on the four elements of prayer that Paul is emphasizing. There is, first of all, thanksgiving. With thanksgiving, Paul says, uh, whenever we turn to God, there is always cause for thanksgiving. And sometimes that's very difficult because uh, of our situation. There are times when there is great pressure, there's great sorrow perhaps, there is great uh, inward tension and stress. And our whole situation uh, makes Thanksgiving so very, very difficult. And yet Paul is saying to us, always when we come to God, we come with Thanksgiving. Because in all our darkness there is still light. And uh, you remember how he says in Ephesians, for example, that we give thanks to God always and in all things. Imagine that. And again, the psalmist says, each day I rise, I will bless you and praise your name time without end. And some of those days, it's very hard to bless God and some days it's hard to give thanks for our own situation. And yet Paul is saying to us, on your knees, always remember the cause for thankfulness today and in the situation. Remember at the most fundamental level that God is. And how that itself lightens up our otherwise dark world. There is one in control. There is a governor. There is a sovereign. Someone who reigns this world in wisdom. We plant our foot on that uh, great rock. Remember too that Christ is praying for us. Not only we for ourselves, but he praying uh, for us uh, as well. And remember too, and this is sometimes so hard. Remember that God loves us. That's the, the great thing, the point where we start. That love is always a reality. And so always in this darkness, there are factors which ought to prompt our gratitude to God himself and his uh, love, his wisdom, but also almost always There are providential factors. There are evidences still of God's kindness 
in our own temporal situation. There are those who love us, and those who care for us, and those who support us. And so for them, let's be thankful, even in bereavement and in what is sometimes unimaginable loss. Remember the living as well as the dead. And cling to God's great hope and consolation that one day we shall be with the Lord together. And so this uh, uh, simple and yet uh, fundamental principle, in the darkness there is always light, if only we had eyes to see it. I know how difficult it is, and yet always this cause for thanksgiving. And then Paul gives us three great words of petition because for Paul and the Bible, that's what prayer is. It's asking God for things. Sometimes we make it very, very uh, fancy and complicated, but fundamentally it is asking God for things. And there's these three great words here. First of all, the word prayer itself. It's a word which is used in the Bible only of address to God, only of speaking to God. A reminder to us that on our knees here we are aware of being in a very, very special presence, the presence of the Lord God Almighty, a creature <coughs> speaking to his maker and his creator. And in that moment when we say, Our Father which art in heaven, we are aware of that heavenliness, that numinousness, that deity, that divineness of God, all that power, all that wisdom, all that great uh, omnipotence, because that's what prayer is, it's impotence, reaching out sometimes desperation uh, towards omnipotence. So where am I? And who am I talking to? I realize your Father in heaven, that heaviness, that numinousness, that uh, divineness, so hugely important. This God who can do whatever he wills to do. And sometimes we ask God for limited things, limited prayers. For example, someone is ill, maybe terminally so, and so we say to God, Lord, help them to cope. And forget, yes, God can help them to cope, but God can also heal them. And so why stop with help them to cope when God can do uh, so much more? And I come to the point where I say to God so often, Lord, do what you can for them. Because I can't ask for anything greater in the presence of our Heavenly Father. But also this grasp, of course, too, that he is our Father. Not only heavenly, but also our Father. And we have lost this this, this assurance of God's love. And I know that you can't convert that term and say love is God because it's not. And when we, do, when we deify love, it becomes demonic, as someone has said, because sometimes love is involved to justify anything and everything. And so love is not God. But yet our faith as believers is in the love of God. Those great reformers, Luther and Calvin, they so stressed this assurance of God's love. And they so needed it. And Calvin said, you cannot pray, you cannot pray unless you know that God is your Father. You can't pray in faith unless you know that God is your Father. We need that assurance. Let's not underplay it. 
or count it something we can do without. We need to know that the one we pray to actually cares. Every human child needs to know that his or her parents love them. We need that same assurance. When God adopts us, God sends into our hearts the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Abba, Father. And so here we have this prayer talk, this talk with deity, and we know his divine power and godness, but we know too his fatherly tender love and his care there on our knees before him that he can and he loves us and he will do what is for our good. And so we come and we pray and we come to, Paul says, with supplications. And in that word there is there is great emotional content because it's a soul asking for something that she really, really wants. There is urgency here. There is real need, real desire, real longing, a real wanting uh, of this uh, particular blessing. And so we wrestle with God. And that is so, so important that we do wrestle. Remember Hannah, she prayed. She prayed with her heart but her lips weren't moving not a sound was heard nothing could be heard her lips moved but nothing audible but her heart was engaged fully in this prayer of near desperation Paul too in that uh, passage we read he prayed not once not twice but thrice the Lord in Gethsemane again three times in that agony of earnestness. You know, sometimes our prayers don't express our real desires. James says to us at one point, you know, I say sometimes you fall into trials and testings. You don't go seeking for them but you fall into them. They come unsought, unsolicited and unexpected. And then he says, you need wisdom. And then go and ask God for that wisdom to cope with the situation, this, this test, this trial. If you lack it, ask God who loves giving. But he said, beware. Beware of double-mindedness, lest you pray for one thing, but you want something different. Need I explain that? You know, so often the words pass our lips, and yes, perhaps we think we want this, we want to be holy. There's a famous prayer of St. Augustine, where he prayed, Lord, make me chaste, but not now. He didn't want it. And sometimes we pray for things, but insincerely we don't want them. And that prayer is a prayer of a double-minded person, the one who pretends to want and pretends to ask, but if or doesn't. There is often a cost in answered prayer, often a sacrifice involved, often a self-denial involved. And so do we pray with single-mindedness. And so there's earnestness. We pray for holiness. We pray to conquer a sin. We pray for revival, for the conversion for those we know and of those we love, for the well-being of God's cause, we pray for God's blessing upon an enemy. Do we pray with that urgency we have here in this word, 
Remarkably, the same word is used by Paul uh, to Corinthians 5 of evangelism, where he says, We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. And the great preachers of our, of our youth in this island and elsewhere, and they wrestled with us in the pews, and they besought, and they pled, and expostulated, and urged, and pressed upon them, often with tears, that they would turn to Christ for their salvation. That's what this kind of word, what this word means, the prayer of urgent, importunate desire for what we really want for our own souls and for those for whom we plead. And so that here we are before God, perhaps in a difficult situation and yet giving thanks to God. And we know we're here in God's own presence in all his divine glory and all his parental love and care. And we know we have a need that must be supplied. And so we are praying with urgency. We want it. And then there's another word we have here. Let your request be made known to God. And it's uh, very specific. I want. I want. And I know that today there's a kind of reluctance to define prayer in those terms. We want to elevate it to perhaps it's, it's communion with God or it's immersing yourselves in God or whatever. But your catechism says to you, it's the offering up of your desires unto God. Prayer is petitionary. It's asking, it's needing, it's wanting and doing so with urgency. And it has requests, it has specific requests, it wants from God. I want to speak of a kind of shopping list. And yet God can say to us on our knees, what do you want, my child? What is your request? What are you here for? What are you asking? Let your requests uh, be made known to God. And I want to pause on this, this request issue uh, for just a moment. Because there is this great question, how do we know what to ask for? And that's an urgent question. And sometimes we can simply say, well, would God give us whatever we ask? Doesn't God say to us, ask and you shall receive? The Lord says, if you ask in my name, whatever you ask, I will give it to you. And sometimes we build on that the doctrine that whatever I ask, God is going to give me. And sometimes when he doesn't, we get all upset. We think there's something wrong between ourselves and God when he doesn't give us what he asked for. I read some weeks ago a comment by a distinguished uh, Anglican scholar uh, on this issue, Alex Bautier. And he said this, and I found it very sobering. If I were sure, he said, that God had promised me whatever I asked, I would never pray again because I don't have enough confidence in my own wisdom to know what to ask. Isn't that a sobering thought? If God said to me unconditionally, as remember uh, Herod said in that fateful moment, uh, and he, he said, what do you want? And she said, I want the Baptist's head on a plate. Does God say to us, whatever you want, whatever you ask, I will give it to you? Someone else said in response to that, that would mean, uh, she said, being ruined by my own hand. God has discretion 
It's what you ask in my name. And at my discretion, you see my wisdom, my love, my power. I will answer as I see your need. You see that in some great moments in the Bible. Remember David when Bathsheba's child became ill. And he prayed and prayed in the full meaning of this word supplication in the verse we're looking at here for the moment. He was so importunate, so urgent, he fasted. He didn't sleep. He lay on the ground in a torment, an anguish of earnestness. And the child died. Remember then how he rose and how his courtiers were so appalled. While the child lived, they said, he was so distraught. And now he's dead, and he's pulling himself together again. They couldn't understand, but he said he knew there was no more he could do. But he had prayed, and God had granted his request. Now, I'm not sure if I know the whys of God's wisdom there. I know that Solomon's birth comes after that. But God didn't tell David why he hadn't saved that child and some parents perhaps even here I know that same anguish in some ways the most awful anguish we can know as human beings the loss of a child and we pray and God has an answer and perhaps it's disturbed and upset our faith that was David's situation God said no for his own reasons or see the Apostle Paul again with that thorn in the flesh. And he was saying to God, Lord, this thorn is such an impediment to my ministry. It's holding me back. And I'd serve you ever so much better if I didn't have it. And so he prays and prays and prays and prays to God. Take it away. The Lord says no to him. The Lord says, stop asking, because my grace is sufficient for you, and that thorn has an important part to play in your ministry. Now remember, all of us have a ministry, not only ministers, elders, and so on, but every single one of us, of you, you all have your own ministry, and parents, a society, whatever. And maybe you feel there's something holding you back in your ministry. And you think you'd be so much more efficient and more effective without it. And so you pray, I have my thorns, my impediments. I know what they are. I've got to negotiate them every day. I start praying about them. And Paul, you see, learned this great lesson that God's strength was made perfect in his weakness, God said to him, Paul, that thorn keeps you dependent, keeps you from self-sufficiency, keeps you feeling that you so need my grace, keeps you humble, and that's why it's there. And Paul rises after his third prayer and says, I will glory in my weakness. I'll glory in this thorn because it's the ideal context for God's grace to operate in and so he prays this man of God with such earnestness and God has not grant his prayer and then turn to an even more eminent and glorious figure than St. Paul himself to our Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and the cup that cup that terrifies him and fills him with all that makes him tremble. And he prays to his father, let this cup pass. And did he want it really? Most certainly. There is such earnestness there too, isn't there? The threefold prayer, the agony of bloody sweat, 
throw himself to the ground, Abba, there must be some other way. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. And of course, there was no other way consistent with God's plan for the salvation of the world. The Son of Man had to suffer. That cup had to be drunk. And that cup, that dying on Christ's part, was part of God's great eternal plan of salvation. In fact, it was the key and pivotal moment in that plan of salvation. For all we know, sometimes those things we want not to be are pivotal somewhere in God's plan for us. And so if you've prayed, and God has granted your request to remember David, remember Paul, and remember the Lord himself. God has his own reasons for not always granting us what we request of him in prayer. How then shall we know what to pray for in my name? We can pray for whatever God has promised. And I think especially those unconditional promises, those guaranteed promises that God has made to us. Uh, Edward Irving said once that the best preparation of prayer, he said, is a knowledge of the scriptures. Why? Because they contain all the promises of God. And on your knees you're asking, what has God promised? And asking, are the things he's promised I haven't yet asked for, but I need? Is there a promise for this situation? A promise here for me and my people and God's people as a whole? I pray, remember Knox again, prayer is the breath of faith. And faith always rests on the promises of God. What promises might these be that God guarantees always to answer? Well, first of all, there is this. The promise implicit for us in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come. That is a command, but it's also a promise. A promise that this, this small mustard seed will grow to be a huge tree that God's kingdom will expand. And here before God, before our Father in heaven, our first, first thought is not for ourselves and for our needs. And I find that so hard because very often you pray in urgency and your first word is a word about your own need. Like, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Lord, help me. And it's yourself, you see, that's there. And of course, in the Lord's Prayer, your needs are there. Your daily bread. What you need this morning for the rest of the day. And what you need tonight for tomorrow. And that's about the limit of it not guarantees for my retirement, but daily bread to live at that level of dependence upon God, how challenging that is. I remember years ago being in uh, uh, northeast India and seeing the marvelous uh, group of believers in that part uh, of the world in the Burmese border. And there were women there, and every day they had to earn enough money by collecting firewood and other such stuff to allow the purchase of enough rice for that particular day. They were that close to the bread line or to the rice line, a survival economy, vibrant in their faith, walking miles to church services every evening of the week, and yet living there, give us today 
her daily rice. Nothing beyond that. That was all. Well, yes, we have a right to ask God for that temporal provision. But it doesn't come first. On my knees, first of all, I remember God's kingdom and God's name and the doing of God's will. And so I'm going to wrestle with them over that, am I? I'm going to supplicate, going to plead, as I plead with the unconverted, to turn to Christ. Lord, remember your name. Remember your kingdom. Under such attack from forces human and superhuman, from forces demonic, and from within itself as well. And so, Lord, please have mercy on your name, not just on me, but on your name and your kingdom and on your will. And that is, I think, a categorical promise God has made. How it implemented, I'm not always clear, perhaps very seldom clear. But I'm asking, is that what you mean by praying? Pray for God's kingdom to come, to come in your own heart. Lord, come and reign ever more and more in my heart. And ever more and more in the hearts of my family, and of my church and community. Let your kingdom come, Lord, here and come there and come to the ends of the earth. Pray for the coming of God's, of God's kingdom. That is God's own great promise. And then coming to where I was this morning earlier. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Lord, you have promised it. You know, when you know yourself, it is the most incredible thing that God can be reconciled to you and God can forgive what you are and what you do. Every convinced sinner knows the wonder of mercy, never taken for granted or presumed upon, but this too begged for, supplicate on the basis of, of God's promise. I read just a few days ago a remarkable comment by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones related to this particular theme. It's in his book on spiritual depression, a splendid work of pastoral theology. And there's a sermon there, uh, it's called That One Sin. Something in our lives that hinders us, that we think is unforgivable and leaves us in a state of constant spiritual depression. The doctor had met many in that condition in his own long ministry. Many had come, and he would say, well, there's this comfort and this and that, justification by faith alone, etc., 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 but always this, ah, yes, doctor, but that one sin, that one sin. And sometimes it's kept people from Christ altogether, and sometimes meant that those who have committed such a sin go on limping throughout their lives. The doctor says a remarkable thing. Stop praying about it. And I found it shocking in many ways. But he meant this. He said, all you're doing is bringing it back and back and back and back and back. And it's there every day. And you're forgetting God has cast it into the depths of the sea. God has blotted out that sin. And I almost say at that point what the Lord said to Martha when he told her that those who died in him were alive. 
even though they died. And he said, Believest thou this? And he said it twice. Do you believe that? That those who believe in me, though they die, yet they live. Do you believe that? And I'm saying, do you believe, with respect to your own sin, that God has, God can, God will bury it, and God will obliterate its memory? Believe us thou this. And so rather let that sin fester, take our peace, the joy of salvation from us, to take you to God and to leave it there with him. This promise, confess, and he forgives, and he cleanses. How often does the psalmist uh, say that? I have acknowledged my sin, and you forgave my guilt, and gave me a token of that forgiveness. And such rejoicing follows that great moment and that great insight into God's grace. And again, there is this other promise. My grace, which one in Hebrews, he says to us, ask God for grace to help in time of need. We have this great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God. And so we come with boldness. And what do we ask for? Well, it says you ask for mercy to cover the past. Because that's all that can be done with the past. And what an insight that is. Ask God. Lord, cover it. Cover it from yourself. But am I also to say, Lord... Cover it from me too. Because I hate looking at it. Uh, perhaps you say we never forgive ourselves. That may be a kind of orthodoxy. This is biblical teaching, I'm not so sure. But there's more than the past to be covered. The grace to help, to help in time of need. And here we are, perhaps in a time of need in our own particular lives some time of need and uh, we say to God Lord there's that great promise grace to help and that word help it's again a very precise and a technical uh, term and uh, it's used in acts so of a moment uh, on Paul's uh, voyage to Rome when the sailors in the storm, they, they bind the ship. They have these great specialist ropes with which they bound the ship. And they uh, wrap the hull, the rock was from the hull, to prevent the hull breaking up in the storm. And grace to help gives that kind of image where... We are in danger of breaking up. The ship would fall apart. And so those special helps which would round and round and round the hull to save it from breaking up. And sometimes you've been, perhaps, where you're in danger of breaking up, of going to pieces. Lord, grace to help in time of need, that God will give us that grace to help in time of need. And then again, there is this promise that God gives us to, we are kept by the power of God unto salvation, by his power unto salvation. And how important that is to and to him, says Judah, is able to keep us from falling, from falling, from declension, from backsliding, from apostasy, from final falling away. Oh yes, God has promised to keep us 
And yet we can't, we don't take advantage of that, do we? And yet we know that grace in our hearts is a very tender plant in a very hostile soil. As our brother said in his prayer, unless we are kept, we cannot keep ourselves. Oh, shall I go forth then trembling every day? Shall I make it? Shall I make it? Shall I make it? Or shall I cast myself on the grace of God who said that when he begins a good work, he perfects it into the day of Jesus Christ. How conscious we are of our own frailty, of our own fragility in the face of those mighty forces of hostility and of destruction. No man, said Jesus, can pluck them out of my hand. And then again, no man can pluck them out of my father's hand. Two great hands. My hands and my father's hands. Remember the hymn of John Newton, Amazing Grace, you all know it. I'm sure better than I do. It was grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace shall lead me home. No matter what, a, what age we are, what's left of this journey is still perilous, and we are still ourselves vulnerable. But grace will lead me home. Believest thou this? <laughs>